Next, from the City Club of Chicago, Greg Bays, the president and CEO of the Illinois Manufacturers Association, gives an address titled, Illinois' Wake Up Call, Government is Closing Illinois One Day at a Time, in which he outlines how state policies are hurting manufacturing jobs. This runs about 35 minutes. Paul, thank you very much. It's um, a pleasure to uh, be here. I uh, made the comment, a couple of my friends that were here, we had to get lunch started early because guys our age want to be able to eat dinner early, so we did that. <laughs> um, it is also nice to see a lot of old friends from eras gone by and good friends that I work with, and I really appreciate them coming out today. Uh, before I begin today, I um, want to draw your attention to these numbers. If there's anything that you recall from the day, just remember these, and I'll talk about them just a little bit later. As I told Jay, it was almost 10 years ago, September, uh, I think it was 16, 2006, I stood on this very podium and began my speech with this quote. Since 2000, Illinois has been facing a perfect storm for its industrial base. Economic downturns from natural cycles were severely worsened in 2001 when Mad Ben flew planes into the World Trade Center. The ensuing economic downturn seemed to be the epicenter in this state, especially the manufacturing base. We lost nearly 200,000 jobs since then. If it was a, an Illinois city, it would be the second largest city in Illinois. Those were good paying jobs. But there was no outrage, there was no concern at the time. No one seemed to be bothered. Again, that was 10 years ago. I'm tempted, Paul, to be able just to take that speech out today, pass it around, we'll adjourn rather quickly, go across to the Irish bar, and you can buy the first round of drinks. We got one did it. Uh, Not that I know. Not that you know. My friends, what the hell is going on in Illinois? The jobs numbers are worse. More than 300,000 manufacturing jobs are now gone. Our pension system is further in debt. We've suffered through another recession. We've impeached the governor and convicted him. We've, low, we've raised the state income tax and then we lowered it. We have nearly $10 billion in backlogs and bills that aren't being paid on time. And the pension debt is eating up nearly 20% of the state's revenue base. Ladies and gentlemen, government is closing Illinois one day at a time in this state. I'm here today to give notice and give voice the frustration of my members, some of which are here today, my chairman Bill Hickey of a third generation steel company, along with other board members are gathered here today. And I'm here to give voice to what I hear from them every day, every week. They've had it. Many of them won't take it anymore. They aren't necessarily fleeing the state in droves, but many have left, mm -hmm. and some instead are just not expanding here when the opportunity or the need arises, they look elsewhere. Before I go into details, let me say there is plenty of blame to go around for this cause. The problems have worsened over the past decade, I believe, because of a lack of executive leadership. We have had no real debate or discussion on the core structural problems facing this state and the employers of this state until Bruce Rauner was elected. As Pogo, and for you younger members of the audience, a comic strip from post-World War II said, we have seen the enemy, and it is all of us. I have seen year after year general assemblies run by Republicans and Democrats alike pass the buck on serious problems facing this state. From decisions not to fund pensions, to letting state obligations grow, causing vendors to wait on payments only to be mollified by a 1% interest a month on their overdue bills. They have ignored the raising or the rising property taxes in counties across the state. They've added to the sales tax that allows us to have the dubious honor right here in Cook County of having the highest sales tax in the country. Today is a shout from the top of the roof. It is a plea to stop the direction that we are headed. We are destroying one of the state's most important economic sectors and we are losing ground and high paying jobs that go with it. The laughing stock that is Illinois is not funny to my members and it should not be funny to the governing class. Almost every day and certainly every week I hear the same refrain from my members. 
My plan is to move my company. I will not invest another dollar here. I want to make sure my kids don't have this company to run in this state. And as Jim Bodman, the CEO of Vienna Beef, said this weekend in the Tribune, the state of Illinois is just very difficult to deal with because they don't have any money. We are caught in a position where we, as citizens, owe so much money to the pension debt, we will never get ahead. It would be easy to pack up and leave Chicago and Illinois. We could be a much more profitable company in Wisconsin a terrible indictment. When I first began my jobs in government in 1977, Illinois was viewed by many as a land of opportunity. Agriculturally rich, robust manufacturing, strong educational institutions, great transportation corridor, hardworking middle class. The notion of Indiana being a major competitor for our jobs was laughable. Today they put up billboards laughing at us. Now people talk about how the middle class is in trouble, and it is. They are not lying when the politicians repeat that phrase over and over. But some of those who talk the loudest about protecting the middle class are actually doing more to push it out of existence. For decades, manufacturers have been the best producers of middle class jobs in the nation. People from all walks of life look to manufacturing for jobs that paid good middle class wages, offered health insurance, pension plans, an ability to educate your children and raise a family. For too many in this state, that, those days are gone. What I'm describing now is how many of my members feel, and man, do they feel it. And please keep in mind that about 85% of my members are small and medium-sized small and medium-sized companies that are second or third generation owned. They feel that slowly but insidiously government is being led by politicians who think they're the experts in running business or in how to run a business. They see government dictating wages and opportunity, mandating nearly every aspect of how to run a business, and too often view employers as an eternal piggy bank. But how to solve every woe in society, they know how to do it. Since 2000, Illinois politicians have added 4,709 pages of laws. That's how many. Additional, lots of regulations and rules that take up additional books like that, that businesses large and small, retailers, financial experts, and others have to follow in operating in a business like here in the city of Chicago or Illinois. Two of the most oppressive governmental units, I believe, to employers in the nation. My members see great irony in these units of government trying to tell them how to operate when they seemingly can't even operate their own shop. Now there is no doubt that manufacturing creates wealth in this country, the type of wealth that offers chance for the middle class to have security. But as industry leaves this state, we also see a disappearing middle class. It's not a coincidence, it's the cause. How about some facts? Now, I know facts shouldn't get in the way of a good story, but on January 1st, 2000, for example, 6,008,000 people were employed in Illinois. Last month's statistic, 6,013,000. Net increase of 5,000. And that's typical of the steady stream of bad news that we're experiencing. An ironic moment occurred in 2006. That was the day that the Rubicon was crossed when the Department of Employment Security noted that 844,000 people were employed by government, only 841,000 in manufacturing. That was for the first time that that had ever occurred since World War II, and the gap has been widening ever since. Since Illinois manufacturing has lost approximately, or since 2000, Illinois manufacturing has lost over 304,000 jobs. At the start of the millennium, 877,000 people now 573,000. And if the multiplier effect is created or says that one and a half jobs are created for every manufacturing jobs, literally hundreds of thousands of jobs have disappeared or were never created. And it's happened across the state. The Chicagoland MSA, 39%, almost 40%. Rockford, 26%, Peoria, the same. 
the Quad Cities, 20, Decatur, 18 percent, adding up to 33 percent of the manufacturing employment lost in the state during that time period. Could there be a correlation between these numbers and the woeful decline of the middle class in this state? These are not faceless statistics. Each of these 304,000 people, they had a name, they had a family, they had hopes and dreams. But for too many, those have now become nightmares. Now some of those jobs went away because of market pressures, increases of productivity and automation. Manufacturers are actually at their very best when it comes to adapting to the change in technology and producing technology gain, or productivity gains. As of 2014, the median income in this state was $57,444. When you compare that figure to a typical manufacturing wage with benefits in health care, it's a compensation package of over $75,000. Many of the people who have lost their manufacturing job or simply cannot find another one have to resort to whatever is available, which too often is a traditional minimum wage position. A job maybe that was created to be designed as an entry level spot at least temporary, not permanent. And of course, government officials who are very good at treating the symptom instead of curing the disease ignore the culpability in driving jobs away and instead attack those employers for not offering higher wages or ben increasing benefits. The truth is, the outrage shouldn't be focused on minimum wage employers, but instead a political system that has turned the economy upside down. The better fix is to let's start creating $75,000 a year jobs, not $31,000 a year, which is what the fight for 15 creates. So it's harder for Illinois workers to get into the middle class today. As generational employment of the middle class has gone, the ripple effects of these barriers have a devastating effect on individual outcomes, communities, and our overall state economy. We keep hearing the call for return to middle class values or the middle class is being destroyed. But tell me, what policies have we really enacted in this state to grow and revitalize our middle class? Name one, it's hard to do. Now let's be clear, a change in a tax policy or regulatory obstacles will not jolt the system immediately into increasing manufacturing levels back to pre-2000. Even with the job losses we have suffered during the last decade and a half, Illinois manufacturing still produces 12% of the state's GDP, nearly the same as it was at that time. But if we are to compete for the advanced manufacturing operations that are being developed today and built, the digital and 3D manufacturing plants that you see around the world, we must change Illinois' trajectory. So it's time, I believe, to drastically change our philosophy. It's time to restore some common sense into the public policy arena. And I'm going to propose a few agenda items, a middle-class manufacturing agenda that people in Springfield ought to seriously think about. First, God, we must get the state's fiscal house in order. The irresponsible spending and the lack of balanced budgets have caused businesses to rethink their plans for expansion or capital expenditures close or reduce their level of workforce. Businesses crave predictability. That is why we need to get spending under control. We must balance the state's budget. We must make necessary changes and adopt meaningful pension reform in, and do it right away. Where in any world does a 100 billion pension obligation be explained away by its constitution? If the Constitution has to be amended, then I implore our leaders to solve this problem. The elected leadership on both sides of the aisle should get about the business of doing it. A constitutional provision that was drafted in 1970 cannot and must not bankrupt this state. <laughs> and to a point that was made last of what occurred last week, that the decision made by the Supreme Court that threw out the opportunity to change the legislative maps only increases the cynicism that many feel in living in this state. Second, it is time that we enact some meaningful and permanent workers' compensation reforms. 
Now, I know most of you have heard me speak before, begin to nod off at this point and say, oh yeah, we hear about that all the time. Change workers' comp, we know that that's what it means. Take benefits away from injured workers. But does it make sense that Illinois employers are forced to pay an average compensation of $439,000 for an arm injury when the national average is $169,000? Is it logical for doctors who get paid $2,500 for a rotator cuff operation under Medicare, turns around and charges $7,856 for the same exact surgery when it's paid for by the work comp premium or insurance policy? And is it fair for the employer to be on the hook for 100% of the cost of an injury when they are not the primary or even the major cause of the accident? Illinois has the seventh highest workers' compensation cost in the country. Moreover, higher worker comp costs remain one of the top issues that deter businesses of all sorts from growing, locating, or expanding businesses here. Higher work comp costs have driven more jobs from Illinois than any other misguided policy and therefore disproportionately contributed to our middle class vanishing. Note, the overall goal of the system is still the same, to make sure that an injured worker gets back to work as soon as possible or is compensated appropriately for the loss of anything the injury may have caused. But at what point do our elected leaders push back on the union leaders, the trial bar, medical professionals, and the myriad of other interests that feed off this system and finally say, enough? Third, tax reform. Any tax expert will tell you that we need to have a fair, broad-based tax system. And if more people are paying taxes and businesses are creating jobs, more revenue will stream into the state's coffers. I believe we must modernize and make permanent the research and development tax credits, along with manufacturing purchase credit and graphic arcs exemption. Illinois policymakers have allowed these exemptions, which most every other state has or completely eliminates, that they have allowed them to be sunset four times in the last 13 years. These credits work, they create middle class jobs, they send a strong signal to employers in the state and also to the country that Illinois is welcoming to business. Research and development is the lifeblood of manufacturers that must constantly create new and improved products that compete in the marketplace. The average R&D job in Illinois is over $100,000 in pay to its workers. A state that is a leader in pharmaceutical and advanced manufacturing should not go one day without that particular credit. The Illinois estate tax is punitive and is driving companies out of this state. It negatively impacts small and medium-sized manufacturing companies as well as farmers in the agriculture world that hurts families where the business has been three or four generations. Illinois needs to repeal the estate tax, as California has, or at a minimum tie it to the federal exemption when wealth flees the state or the, our long-term future is damaged. Now, I believe that the IMA and the business community could support additional revenue, and only, but if and only if Illinois leaders take the necessary steps to enact meaningful and permanent economic development reforms and fiscal reforms. Simply pouring more money into the broken system is not acceptable. And finally, Illinois leaders need to take at long last tackle the patently unfair, overtly political property tax system in Cook County. For decades, politicians have kowtowed to the residents, the homeowners, by keeping property taxes arbitrarily low while shifting the tax burden onto the commercial and industrial taxpayers in this county. Remember that earlier chart showing nearly 40% of the manufacturing jobs lost in the Chicago MSA? Friends, this is your culprit. And if things aren't bad enough, there is a looming problem that has been grossly underreported. Manufacturers and, work and companies in general are facing a severe skills gap as baby boomers retire. Nearly 300,000 manufacturer workers will retire in the next decade. We need to replace 5,000 engineers, 25,000 production workers each and every year just over the next 10 years to be able to keep up. We need to encourage students who like to make things to view manufacturing as a career choice. Companies that cannot find skilled workers 
we'll move on. Now, maybe if some of you may find that I'm painting an exaggerated picture about some of the dire times that we face in this state. Well, let me just take you through a little drive around Illinois to remind you of things. Driving out through communities like my old hometown of Jacksonville, it's hard to miss the empty skeletons of old factories that reflect numbers cited above. Jacksonville and towns like Decatur, Peoria, Rock Island, reflect of a tired image of an era gone by. With manufacturing gone, retail and other commercial interests have also disappeared. Drug and crime levels have increased as communities have seen their younger populations leave. Now fortunately, there are places and bright spots around the state. Our good members at Chrysler and Ford are adding employees and we see full parking lots and facilities in the southeast side of Chicago or Belvedere. But finally, an image of the way it used to be can be quickly found by driving just a few moments away from those facilities. The empty manufacturing and retail that dots all across our state in small town and in the urban areas of Chicago. I worked for Governor Thompson during a time when we have last attracted a large manufacturing facility, a new plant, Mitsubishi, located in Bloomington Normal. Unfortunately, it has fallen victim to the competitive marketplace. Do we really think, though, that under the current climate, Bloomington Normal can attract another auto manufacturer to that location? It has been 30 years since we have been able to be able to attract a large facility like that with all the great attributes and things that we have to offer. Illinois must rebuild and support its manufacturing base. We must do it in order to prosper and grow as a state. It was once the backbone of our economy, and because of policy failures, I believe, we have let the found firm, found, uh, firm foundation crumble around us. Innovation, growth, new products, new jobs, revitalized communities are more importantly a thriving middle class are all possible again. There are policy solutions we can explore to bring industry back to Illinois. Among those I've cited were comp, pension reform, meaningful approach to taxes and regulation, which start us in the right direction. But when opponents reject these ideas or push back, it is time that all of us ask them a question. Tell us, how well has this current policy been working? The numbers paint a very, very dire picture. A manufacturing rebirth in Illinois should be a top priority on all of our lawmakers' minds in both the executive and the legislative branch. I hope to see a revitalized middle class in this state that begins to take advantage of many of the benefits that we have. We are well positioned in this country to be able to do it. And I hope this discussion that we are now beginning to have will spark, yes, outrage, I guess is the word, being upset that this has occurred, that three, that we have just let it go on without asking the hard questions. So just remember as you leave, remember these numbers. Wisconsin has created 44,000 jobs in manufacturing in the last seven years. Ohio has created 75,900 jobs. Indiana, 83,700. Michigan, 171,000. Illinois, 4,600. Hell, even Idaho created 9,100. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's abysmal, my friends. It's pathetic. It's time for a change in philosophy and direction of our policymakers in this state. And frankly, it's time to get mad as hell and not take it anymore. Thank you. Hardcover. Uh, we have questions, please. And of course, for those of you taking Greg's advice really seriously, we'll have small vials of hemlock out there for those of you who think it just ain't worth it. It just ain't worth it. Uh, here we go. Start off with a hardball. Michael Weiser, because you typed it up. That's really good. How you did, I don't know. A commuter Cars Corporation. What is your view on Illinois taking part in self-driving car manufacturing? Absolutely. Quick answer. 
we should. I mean, well, it's, it's an example of the technology and the changes that's occurring. I was in um, uh, members of my facility uh, a couple of weeks ago where talking about the, a chrome piece or steel piece that it had been man is manufactured there for BMW. It's for their 10-speed uh, X5s and X6s cars that they're making in Spartanburg, California, or in Spartanburg, South Carolina. The steel comes from Germany because it's the best steel they possibly, they have to have it. They send it to Wisconsin and northern Michigan to steel mills to be first refined and then to my member's facility and then it's sent on to Spartanburg, South Carolina. It's the kind of example of the changes they need such a pure product for that particular activity, just running a transmission that they do those kinds of things. So the question on the cars, that's where we're headed. We have to be part of that in the advanced manufacturing. Okay. Long answer. Well, heck. Got to give him his feet typed it. Yeah, he typed it up. <laughs> Dave, Dave Lundy, one of the more conservative members of this organization <laughs> from Aileron. Illinois has a myriad of problems, but it, take, it also has a hidden strength. What is the number one advantage we have in attracting manufacturers and other in this industrial businesses? And you can't say the IMA. Um, the number one advantage is still a workforce. Uh, the, again, another member I was visiting talked about that they had moved a facility to Tennessee a few years ago. And they'd opened a plant, in fact, moved it from Franklin Park because of the property taxes. That was the reason. However, that manufacturer would admit to you today the abilities and the ability to attract the workers in Tennessee versus his facilities here in Illinois are much dif more difficult. They said, I'll take my workforce over Illinois any day as possible. So I think that the, the people we have here, the work ethic, the, the background that is there is still the strongest point. Here we go. J now he's with Jacobs Engineering. Why can't reimbursement rates for medical services be set similar to Blue Cross Blue Shield? Blue Cross Blue Shield? I should have my board member over here talking about that. And <laughs> if that, if, if, if you have multiple choice. Two, where is middle ground on causation? Well, for those of you, you know. <laughs> you know Tim Martin, what do you expect? I know, I know. For those of you who don't know the, what causation means, it is the standard that I mentioned in the, the speech of being an employer in Illinois is a hundred, an injury occurs in their facility is 100% responsible for that particular injury. In other states, there is apportionment of that particular uh, if the injury or if you had a back injury and it was from a pre-existing condition, uh, there are formulas that they use to evaluate how much that current employer is responsible. There's always middle ground if there are reasonable people willing to be reasonable about it. Uh, we understand that the balance, the political balance in Springfield that you have to be able to get to the middle to move the ball forward. We did that in 2011. I am hopeful that some of the uh, seeds that have been sown in last year's um, legislative session with the work groups and the discussions have been talked about, specifically workers' comp that Senator McConaughey is involved in, will yield some of that uh, on a positive basis. Okay, we have one more question coming. Get it up here, Jack. But the moderator, when he asks this question, will probably blow this whole thing up. So I, here we go. We have a. You know, you want me to tell the joke I was going to tell on you? Go right ahead. Now that well, I'm here, I want to that, hear that, it. Well, I was going to. That's right. Well, I was going to say that, you know, the IMA was formed in 1893 just down the street at the Medina Temple when five manufacturers got together and uh, put together the idea that they better go to Springfield because there were some things going on down there they needed to pay attention to. And I like to say, since I've been around, you noted, since 1991, that I wasn't there at that particular meeting, but I know people who were. And then I said, would have said today, if Paul had been here earlier, and of course I read about it in Illinois Issues because he was writing about it in 1893. <laughs> that was my joke. On here. Are there any economic development reforms that can happen outside bottleneck of legislation? If not, what is the G General Assembly appetite to make progress on your agenda? You asked that with a straight face, right? Okay. You're up. Um, members of the General Assembly are always very open to uh, and are very interested in it. Almost every member of the General Assembly has some level of manufacturing in or around their particular area. Um, the speech that I could have handed out from uh, 2006 
the thing that I said in that particular speech at the end is sort of a throwaway and actually got attention was, we should read, you know, the worst thing that's happened to the Illinois General Assembly in my tenure was the cutback amendment Absolutely right. of 1981. <laughs> if, you had, if you had that particular system still in play today, the ability of one person to control the House in the way that that person has controlled it, or in the Senate, or as Pate Phillip controlled the, the Senate when he was in charge, would have been very much more difficult to occur. The appetite for change, I believe a lot of rank and file legislators would love to scream from the high heaven, we, not, we gotta have a change. And then they look at the fact of who's gonna be there with them in October of an election year. And then they're very quiet. Quiet, all right. <laughs> Yesterday, we had a, a very strong debate on an elected school board in Chicago. And instead of talking about money, they talked about democracy. That's like discussing the menu for the Titanic for breakfast after the iceberg. Uh, there's just, the number one problem is money. So, per your, per your speech, people are screaming that everyone's getting ripped off. Working class are getting ripped off. Everyone's getting ripped off. One percent, that guy, what was his name, Bernie, was going around all that stuff. How are you gonna sell your very well-spoken speech when people are saying that you guys are not the answer but you guys are part of the problem. Yeah. It's the thesis of uh, the, the speech that indeed manufacturing has been the backbone of the middle class. It has brought the wealth, it has brought education, has brought lots of things to the fore. But I, th I think the, the real tough question right now that has to be answered uh, in this state is how we do raise our revenues. We're pushing the envelope on, I mean, with all the screaming about the property taxes in Cook County, the balance is starting to come back to where every other of the 101 counties in this state have operated with property taxes. The Cook County property tax system is one of the, if not, is a major culprit of our problems here. My good friend Dave Veit and I were once on a commission back in the mid-90s where the discussion about the swap for income for property was very close. Governor Edgar made it a hallmark of one of his discussions or his uh, changes in tax policy. But for various reasons that I, I don't want to remember these days, that never got off the ground in doing it. But without changing that, my good friend Bill Hickey, my chairman back here, is uh, and operates a facility in Bedford Park. Uh, his property tax bills and what he faces there, when he looks at the notion of being able to have to expand, he's basically needing a new facility. That property tax question is a top priority. And when you look up and down, what is it, Bill 79th Street you're on? Yeah. It's 73rd Street you're on. There's empty manufacturing facility after manufacturing facility up and down that street. And I guarantee you that a major driving force was that particular part of the problem. So the attack on that particular issue, raising sales taxes, broadening general service taxes, the income tax going back up, uh, to where it was two years ago, whatever. Those are all easy. I mean, that, that's, those are not hard to get done. Changing the property tax system in this state and the loss and the tremendous loss of commercial and industrial properties in this county is one of the biggest problems we face and got to be solved or I, I don't know where this state's going to go. What is the second or third highest property tax state in the country? I don't know. Illinois. Okay. So don't run for office in Cook County on that platform. I'm just, I'm just saying. I ran, I ran for office, and uh, Pat Quinn won Cook County rather significantly. <laughs> on that and that's why, and that's why he gets his portrait on the wall, and I don't. So. On that shocking, how about a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.